having uh, Ara, our uh, San Joaquin Presbytery exec, here to share with us. Uh, and uh, I am telling you all right now that uh, his message that I heard in the first service uh, is very, very poignant and powerful. And so get your pen and paper ready Whoa. Um, uh, because uh, he, it, something's going to speak to you from the scripture passage. And I honestly uh, felt like God was um, saying important things to me this morning uh, through what Ara is sharing. And so uh, get ready. I'm unleashing. Uh, <laughs> I'm unleashing the Holy Spirit filled aura right now. All right. So, well, you know, this, I was saying after the service that, you know, for, I've had two churches where I've served 15 years each. And at the end of every sermon, there's some, well, now let's go out and do this. But I can't do that here because I know you. But not, that, not well enough to say, okay, let's get together and go out and do this. But what I do promise to do is I promise to pray for Dan and for the session because there's things that you... 210 is wonderful. It's a great step. But this is nothing compared to what God can do with us. Hallelujah. Yeah, and so this is the thing, to pray for the people who do know a little bit, to, well... I'm getting to the end of the sermon before I even start. It is a joy, a pleasure, and a privilege to be here with you. It was a great pleasure for me to have a friend of mine. We, were exec we, we started executive presbyterying at the same time, and they, you know, they take us because Presbyterians were so good at everything, including uh, shaping and forming our executive presbyters. So they have us all in these beautiful places for a week at a time for the first three years of our life together. So I meet Wilson. I see what a wonderful job they're doing with him. And I'm trusting that the same thing's going to happen to me. And then I go to another gathering of Presbyterians and Wilson has a new job. So Wilson is the Associate Director for Special Offerings and Appeals of the Presbyterian Church USA. But his... <laughs> is there an office with your name on it in Louisville? Wow! But he, he lives near Atlanta, Georgia. He was the EP for Cherokee Presbytery. And he still lives there. He still is a member of that presbytery. He still connects there. But he also has the further obligation to connect in Louisville and to connect with the whole church throughout the United States of America because what comes out of that office encourages us to, uh, makes us aware of important things that need our support even though we are not there. The gifts that God has given us that we return to him can go and do great things. Now he will say that better if after the benediction, talk to him, and he'll say it better than I do, because I don't have the job, he does. <laughs> All right. And it really is a, a, a blessing to be here. Uh, I got my free cup of coffee this morning on Thursdays. I pay for everything, and I don't mind one bit because of the people I get to spend time with. We hear the word of the Lord this morning from the 17th chapter of Genesis. After the first service, someone told me, well, you could have done this, you could have done that. I've been preaching for 40 years. I've preached on this passage at least 50 times because I preach more than once a week. You know, like I've preached in prisons, I've preached at the Fresno Mission on a regular basis, plus my own congregation, two services a Sunday. And so I, I, I preached on this passage a lot. And after my third or fourth year of pastoral ministry, I didn't preach everything about the text. I left some for the next time I'm preaching. And one of the blessings and reminds us of the richness of the gift that God has given us uh, in the witness to the word that is Jesus Christ. I preached on Christmas for 38 years through, through that Advent season. 
and I haven't repeated myself except I preach a sermon on the Magnificat every year, and it brings me to tears every year. <laughs> Mary brings me to tears every year. Every year she does. But the rest of it, al there's always some new theme that appears, and it is wonderful. So this isn't the last word on Genesis 17, nor is it probably the first word you've ever heard on it, but hopefully you'll hear something that'll move you to the place where you might be counted among the blameless and the righteous like Abraham was. But we start off with Abram, the exalted ancestor. You know, these calls on Sunday, just but this is the bad thing about carrying your Bible around in your phone. <sighs> Okay, we hear the word of the Lord. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. We don't hear Abram's, Abram's aside. Well, what? I'm, I've been doing it, buddy. No, no, it, there's none of that. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. The ancestor of multitudes. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. And then it continues... Okay, just a moment. Oh. From the 15th verse, God said to Abram, Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai uh, anymore, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born of a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And I'm adding the 18th verse. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. Just a reminder that blameless and righteous comes after this. Up until that point, a Abram could have been a wonderful Presbyterian. Knows God, studies, learns, grows in faith, and all this kind of stuff. But he's got this. Right? He's got this. I know how to make kids. I know how to make babies. It's not working with Sarah. Sarah and, Sarai and a Abram talk. Well, you know, we've got this Hagar. She looks healthy. She's got birthing hips. Let's go. God, we got this. Okay? And they thought they did it. In fact, Abraham alludes to it. Well, what about Ishmael? God is going to do an extraordinary thing and doesn't need our help. You know, God said and it was. And then he's you know, he says, okay, I'm done. It wasn't just the seventh day. Now I'm retired. Now it's all up to you. This name change is significant because names are powerful. Yokuts Valley, right? Right here. Significant name change? It seems so because it's created quite a fervor in the Central Valley, right? One of my f beloved families that I just got to know in one of my interim uh, calls, I asked them about their uh, family name. 
because I knew the word in Greek, and it's similar to the word in Armenian, and I don't know anyone who's taken that as a family name, like I'd never heard it before. So I asked him, oh no, we were the Clarks, and, and he was the Joneses, but when we got married, we, we created a new name. So like, wow. That's an acknowledgement that they have left a life separate. They've created this new life. We say it in the ceremony. At the wedding, we say God has created something. There's a new creation here. Well, they gave that new creation a name. I couldn't have done that. I'm a Gergesian. And I'll tell you the weight that that name has. My grandfather and grandmother had nine children. Five survived into past the age of three. Four of them were born girls. One of them was born a boy, my dad. So there's Gekezian. All his brothers had come to South America during the leaving after the genocide, and he stayed in Lebanon, Middle East, starting with Egypt and went to, the middle, uh, to Lebanon. And so my dad was the only Gergesian left. I have cousins that are 17 years older than me, a cousin who lives in Fresno, a first cousin who is 10 years older than me. <coughs> but until I was born, there wasn't rejoicing in the Gergesian clan. When I was three and a half years old, my mom took me back to Lebanon and Syria to show me where I came from. She was homesick, you know. She, and so we went back, and we went up to where my father's extended family had settled and kind of taken over this beautiful foothill village. You know, they were living the life. And so there's this big house, and I wa- they open the front door, and you go right into this big room, it, it felt like it was twice the size. It felt like the size of the sanctuary across the patio. That big, it wasn't that big. But I was three and a half years old. And there were chairs along the walls, all filled with these old ladies. Some of them are probably 16, 17 years old. But they all looked old to me. I walk in, the woman on the left picks me up, grabs me, lifts me up, kisses me, well, pinches both my cheeks, kisses me and passes me to the next person. And I'm taken around the whole room because the Gergesian was here. Bernard's son is here. And I had this, I felt this weight from that day on. My brother never had, my brother is four and a half years younger than me, never felt that experience. Imagine if my wife and I, when we got married, we created this new name. Well, I'd have less you know, family <laughs> gatherings to attend. It would have opened up my schedule quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, especially before we moved to Fresno. They're all on the East Coast. So anyway, so that's, that's that power of that name. And something powerful, it's, it says something, and it can be really transforming. In fact, even this small change in Abraham, Ab- Abraham changed him when he went from Abram to Abraham. Because someone, Tom Link, reminded me about, why didn't you mention Abraham being so faithful that he takes this Isaac and, and builds a, a, an altar and, and, and places, binds Isaac up and places him on the altar. At, now that's a whole complicated, that's a whole series of sermons. But the fact, the fact that he's, we have that story shows us that he was righteous and he, he was obedient. Now back to us Presbyterians. Competent, clever, we see problems, we gather together a task force within two weeks, we have a meeting in that month, we come up with a plan of action, uh, a vision, goals, objectives, We go to the session, we get funding, we address the problem. Now, I'm praying for salt and light, but to be quite honest, unless we get out of the way, we're still going to have a housing issue. Because the housing issue is complex. There aren't enough, there's plenty of empty homes. I preach at Three Rivers on occasion. 
Three Rivers has a lot of empty homes, not on the weekends, but during the week. A community of 3,000 is now a community of 750. Because wonderful investors have bought these homes and they fill them on the weekends and the people who come on the weekends don't go to church. Maybe they go to church when they're at home, but they're up to enjoy the lake. They're up to enjoy uh, Sequoia, right? Abram would have made a great Presbyterian. God, we got this. We know how to make babies. God, we got this. We know how to call meetings. We know how to set boundaries. We know how to do things right, decently and in order. Which, which, would, make, which would lead to blamelessness and righteousness, right? By definition. Well, I don't know. I've been in the Presbyterian church for a long time. And it's not just us. I know a lot of dear Southern Baptists. I know a lot of Roman Catholics. I played softball with an Assembly of God pastor. You know, together we played on the same team. We had a wonderful time. And we were very young at the time. And we weren't blameless and righteous back then. Neither one of our gatherings of children of God. So what happens in this transforming moment? Abram bows before God one time. The second time he bows before God and he laughs. Therefore his son's name is Isaac. He laughs. It's a reminder to Abraham and Sarah every day of raising that kid, being exhausted at the end of 190 I mean, I, I, I watch my, uh, my grandkid for 24 hours, and it's two on one. My wife and I watch him, and he leaves, and we collapse. Thinking, raising a child 24-7 at that age? Forget it. But by the grace of God, by the extraordinary power of God, they raised the child at that age. By the extraordinary power of God, something happened to Abraham in that transition from someone who says, God, I got it, for someone who humbles himself before God and says, wow, now all I have to do is raise this child because the extraordinary act had been initiated by God. Now, they, God is going to do something and we just have to figure out what our... God is the actor, and we have to, 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 to be open to hearing what response God wants from us. And now I don't want to embarrass anyone, but he'll get over it. On Thursdays at 1 o'clock, the three of us always, and sometimes there's one or two more, we gather, not in this room, but out there somewhere, and we pray for our new worshiping community. And I never start with the prayer because I'm not there yet. But the one who initiates the prayer in 210 always says, and this is a paraphrase, God, we have no idea what to do with these new worshiping communities. We pray that your will be done. Now what do you want us to do? We pray that God make it clear that we have clear vision to see what our response needs to be. And that is the challenge for us. Because we are capable people. Well, you know Rick, and you know Gail. Rick is the guy who starts every week. But he's older than me, so he should be further along the road on blamelessness and righteousness. He should be. But we gather here, and we are competent people. You know Galen. Galen can do things. I'm telling you, you may not know me well enough, but I am very capable, and I'm very competent. I really am. And, the, and the, the biggest struggle I have is waiting to hear what God wants me to do in part of the extraordinary action that God has initiated in my little congregation, in my little presbytery, in God's little church. Imagine that. Imagine. Just think. No, no, don't imagine. Think about this. 
Abraham's ch- Abraham and Sarah's child, Isaac. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Jesus. There are billions of people on this planet that nominally, at least, by, in name, and we've seen the power of name, by name call themselves the children of Abraham. Billions of them. All the Christians in the world, all the Muslims in the world, all the Jews in the world call themselves children of Abraham. Now, we fight about, you know, like adoption and are you really children and I hate you, I'm going to kill you every chance I get. We're a dysfunctional family, just like Abraham's family. Think about it. Isaac gets married to someone, they have two children, Jacob and Esau. Or Esau, well, it's Esau and Jacob. And the problem comes because people like me say Jacob and Esau. It was an issue. There was dysfunction. Then Jacob has children. He has two wives. He loves Joseph from the, the, the wife that he really loves. With the other one, he has lots of kids, but with, oh, uh, Leah and Ra- Rachel. Ooh, you know, it's a dysfunctional family. The amazing, the miraculous thing, the power of God is how Joseph was useful in God's extraordinary action that during a time of famine, hundreds of thousands, even millions of people got to the next generation because Joseph was faithful. Joseph trusted in the vision that God had given him. Read the rest of Genesis. It's, Genesis is wonderful because you hear, especially this story of Joseph, how everything that happens in his life can make you and me say, oh, I'm done. Joseph says, Joseph remains faithful to the vision. Joseph remains pretty much blameless and righteous. And we see the life that issues from that. Here's the challenge for us. We are capable people. Can we get out of our own way? Can we be, can we be transformed from Abraham, Abram to Abraham? That we're not asking for a church name change. We are asking for a transformation from our inner being so that as we go out there, we're saying God is doing something extraordinary on this corner. God is doing something extraordinary in Visalia. God is doing something extraordinary in California, in our nation, in God's world. God is doing amazing things. Now, God, what do you want? What's my part in it? not saying we got this because clearly we are so capable we are so smart we are so knowledgeable we have such a great constitution a a wonderful book of confessions a wonderful book of order that keeps everything decent and in order and we live in a world that isn't decent and orderly we worship at a church that even at its best falls short of being fully decent in order. And this is a wonderful church. First Presbyterian Church, Visalia is wonderful. Our presbytery, we endeavor to be faithful in all things. And yet, we struggle. Yet there are empty chairs. Yet there are churches we are considering how best to use the gift of property that we have because there's no one worshiping here. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us is that we are are hesitant to let ourselves go and to say, God, you're doing an extraordinary thing. Now we're going to sit here and we're going to pray. And we're going to humble ourselves before you and say, we don't know what we're doing. You know what you are doing. What is our part in it, O God? Make it clear, please. This is 2.10 is a wonderful beginning. It fits in my worldview. But... The first question I'm asking is, what extraordinary thing is God going to do through 210? And then what's the next thing? What's the next extraordinary thing God is already planning that we need to get on board with? That is our challenge, and that's what I'm going to pray for now. 
And I pray that you join me in that prayer, not only in this moment, not only on Thursday. Everyone is welcome Thursday at 1 o'clock. It's not just Gail and Ricky. It's not a closed group. You are welcome. And we talked this last time about extending this to bringing in people via Zoom and maybe even saying like on the fourth Thursday, we're like, I'll drive out to Kolinga and we'll pray there and you can join us with Zoom, that kind of thing. But to, 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 be, to, to have our ears, our eyes, our hearts, our whole soul, the core of our being open so that the Holy Spirit comes in and directs us in the way Abraham was directed. Was life perfect after that? No. But Abraham was counted as blameless and righteous. And that is my deepest desire. I know it is your pastor's deepest desire. I know that's Wilson's deepest desire. I know that's your deepest desire. May God fulfill our deepest desire. And may we stay out of the way of God entering in that place and moving us. Let us pray. Gracious God, as my brother, your child, Rick, prays every Thursday, we humble ourselves before you. We pray that your will be done. You have done extraordinary things, like finding us useful in your work. We pray, we are grateful for that miracle, and now we come before you, humbly asking, what is it that you want from us today? What is it that you want us to be doing as part of your extraordinary work in this world? so that all may come to be covered by the light and grace of Jesus, that all may come and know Christ's peace, that all may partake of the abundant life of being not just children of Abraham, 